Holy Bible. Um, my name is Sarah Rice. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at Central Baptist Church. And we're so excited to have you here this evening. And we underestimated how many people would arrive. Um, it's so nice to see you. And one of the guiding stars, we talk about four guiding stars at Central. And one of them is um, students. One of them is sacrament of gathering. Another one of it um, is love the city. And the last one is theology. And we love to think. We love to bring our mind, our heart, and our whole being before God and to hear what God has to say to us um, through many different ways. And so we're just really excited um, that we have this evening where Sean and Jeff are going to get our minds to engage um, in new ways um, and to think through how science and faith interact. So thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm just going to pray for us. Um, Jesus, I thank you that you have gathered us up tonight to come and to hear um, from Jeff and Sean. I pray that as we listen, that we hear things that inspire us, that ignite our imagination, and that may, that enable us to see the world in new ways. Um, may you bless this night. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Yes, a big welcome from me too. I am Nicola Hogai Pregan, the um, co-director of New Zealand Christians and Science. Um, part of the partnership that we have with um, the Cathedral, um, St John's Willis Street, and um, Wellington Central Baptist. So we're very pleased to see all of you here tonight. Um, it's wonderful <coughs> that you can be here. I did want to say also that um, we're having another another meeting next week on Wednesday night at the Cathedral at seven pm on science and spirituality, where three of us will give short talks on that as well. So please do come out um, again next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And I think you're doing something tomorrow night, is that right, um, Jeff, in Palmerston North? Yeah, so if you if you happen to be in Palmerston North, um, you can hear Jeff again um, tomorrow night. Um, tonight we have um, two physicists, so this is the physics panel, and I'll introduce them both, um, and they'll speak for half an hour each, and after that, I hope we'll have some vigorous discussion, especially as there's quite a lot of us. Um, so first of all, Dr. Sean Devine started off in physics, but has combined that with economics and management. After obtaining a PhD in physics at the University of Canterbury um, and three years overseas, Sean spent 25 years as a government research scientist. And then after studying economics in the 1980s, he moved into science management. Following his role as executive director of the Association of Crown Research Institutes, Sean joined Victoria University as a research fellow and taught strategy for a number of years. Recently, Sean has taken a systems approach to seeing an economy as a far from equilibrium physical system sustained by energy. He's not quite retired, having just um, published a book by I IOP in 2020. And after that, we have Professor Jeff Tallon, who taught physics at Victoria University of Wellington and is a distinguished scientist at Industrial Research Limited, a New Zealand government-owned research institute. He's internationally known for his research discoveries and commercialization of high-temperature semiconductors. They are currently being developed for application across all sectors, health, transport, energy, mining, and minerals processing, telecommunications, information technology, and science. Dr. Tallon's other research interests are in nanotechnology. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and an honorary fellow of the Institute of Practicing Engineers of New Zealand, a visiting fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, and a recipient of the Rutherford Medal. So we're very privileged to have both of you here tonight. So thank you very much. Sean. Good evening. Looks as though I'll kick off. And thanks, Nicola and Sarah. It's it's great for the work. Could I could I just say one one more thing? Um, there is a piece of paper going round where we can capture your names if you would like to be on our list for further um, further events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tonight I'm going to talk <laughs> about narrative, science, and faith, and see if we can make sense of those. And here's a story for you, an illustration. The science student and the humanities student were returning to their car after a drunken party. One dropped their keys when opening the door, 
the humanities student fumbled round in the dark trying to find the keys, the science student went and looked underneath the light, as you would expect. Why are you looking for the keys under the lamppost? asked the humanities student, to which the science student replied, I cannot see anything where you are looking. So that's the difference, perhaps, between science and humanities. <coughs> Science focuses on restricted issues, those that are amenable to rational thought, evidence and consistency. Science speaks from mind to mind, so to speak. It's rational. Often it's reductionist, working from the bottom up, hoping, hoping to understand the whole by adding all the bits below together. But over time, in the last decade or so, it's becoming more holistic, uh, providing an envelope for this bottom-up approach. And so we have conservation laws and physics, and we have the treatment of complex systems and ecologies in other forms of science. And we see it in global warming, which is a whole systems problem. Uh, and we, so you have to move away from the bottom up. <clears throat> but outside the light of science, or this rational process, outside the light, we need plausible narratives to make sense. We can't do it the same way as science. Some people have physics envy, but you just can't solve the real world problems the way you could solve science problems. Science restricts itself to the ones that it can answer, but we don't have the choice in the real world. So we have rules of thumbs, narratives, red sky at night, shepherd's delight might be the best you do in terms of knowing the weather if you don't understand much meteorology. But the point about narrative, it speaks from heart to heart not from mind to mind. And narrative comes as story, drama, art, music, poetry, and so on. Now, is love about dopamine and adrenaline giddying us up? Is it about brain function? Is it about sex? That's a science approach. Or is love like a red, red rose, as Shakespeare said? What is love? Which of those is the most suitable? Well, it depends on the problems you're in, doesn't it? All sense-making has at its core a narrative, which is not always obvious. The science narrative is actually a very coded narrative. So if you don't know the code, you've no idea what these scientists are talking about. And it's restricted to where the light shines, where you can make sense. And you can see well enough to test the consistency of your coded narrative. Science, too, is shaped by an underlying worldview. We believe, or scientists believe, the world is consistent. If I drop my phone today and drop it tomorrow, it will behave in the same way. And reality has meaning for the scientist. And scientists have developed a disciplined form of truth-seeking. Now, the culture wars... I'll just see whether I've got to the right one. Oh, no, I've moved too fast. Okay. Here's another story for you. A father and his son are involved in a car accident when driving home after a football match. The father is killed and the son is taken to hospital with serious brain damage. When the son's wheeled into the operating theatre, the neurosurgeon, on seeing the patient, exclaims, what's happened to my son? Now, I've tried this with about 100 postgraduate students and most of them had difficulty with it. Father's killed, and the neurosurgeon says, what's happening to my son? One of them said, well, perhaps he had a Chinese name, my son. Um, <laughs> another one said, perhaps uh, a culture that muddles up father and uncle and so on, right? But anyone, does everyone understand the problem? Or does it, who, who feels there's a problem there? Are you prepared to say so? Well, one of the students said, my husband's a neurosurgeon and they're all men. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a trap there. We think that women are not neurosurgeons. Well, I hope, I hope 10 years since I've done this, I hope a few more get it right. <laughs> um, but, you know, we are locked into a worldview, an underlying worldview. And the culture wars that we, wars that we have today are when this underlying worldview, this underlying narrative, clashes with other narratives. So it might be societal, religious conflict. 
It's not the narrative that we see at the top that's the cause of the problem, the obvious one. It's what is underneath that we take for granted. And the neurosurgeon analogy, women are neurosurgeons or can be, is an uns what, uh, in the narrative it was an unspoken assumption that women don't do these sorts of jobs. Now, we need to integrate narratives. Global warming requires an integration of the science narrative with a political narrative and an economic well-being narrative. If the scientist was in control, he'd just say, or she would just say, turn all carbon dioxide emissions off, simple, and everyone would die. So you can't just use the scientific approach. So to integrate narratives, we need to engage. And sense-making across narratives involves us exposing the underlying belief system to correct the blind assumptions. The underlying narrative is where conflict lies. <clears throat> so we may not be able to use science for all our problems to solve them, but we can always test and challenge the underlying narrative. If the social scientist finds the key in the dark, then it's testable, it works. But looking in the dark isn't in itself uh, a virtue. Now, open narratives, when we understand the assumptions, open narratives help us to engage. They open the conversation. But if I refuse to consider that a woman could be a neurosurgeon, my narrative's closed. I can't make sense. It might be due to ignorance, laziness, or just male dominance. So truth-seeking relies, relies on us exploring the underpinning narrative. Now, there are dangerous narratives that become truth in themselves. Karl Marx correctly diagnosed the exploitation and oppression of the of, of Europe of, the, of his time. But the underlying narrative that came from this was a closed one. It failed to recognise that the corruption of human nature and believed it was just an education problem, that we run it all long enough, we'd have this perfect society. But what happened was the leaders became the new oppressors and the communist regime. <laughs> An underlying narrative that rejects transcendence also becomes truth in itself. Richard Dawkins' underlying narrative sees the material world as real by science as all that there is. Therefore, God cannot exist. A closed loop narrative. This is a hidden narrative that led to the global financial crash. And this is actually quite serious. These, these hidden narratives, these assumptions, are with us all the time, and we need to question them. After the financial crash, Congress asked Alan Greenspan, who was chair of the Federal Reserve at the time, and this was part of a question, you found your view of the world and your ideology, and, he went, and the questioner went on to say, was not working. Greenspan said, absolutely, precisely, it was shocked disbelief. His underlying narrative wasn't the same, what didn't fit the world as it is. And he should have known. Here's a graph taken before the financial crash, and this is a picture of housing versus years. It starts at 72 and ends at two, uh, 2006. A couple of small housing bubbles, and at this point, 2004, <coughs> There's a, a massive shoot, upshoot in housing uh, prices. That was the cause of the problem. Well, one of the causes, and they didn't know about it. <clears throat> Greenspan's actually a bit like Marx, in the sense that they both failed to allow for greed, namely the financial people, and they didn't talk to people with different perspectives. Greenspan basically talked to his own tribe, the neoclassical economics, economists who um, have been trying to run the world. The full picture was hidden because they didn't engage. And Greenspan believed the market would self-correct, as he said. They should have these bubbles, but you know, the market will fix it up. <clears throat> there are, of course, replacement narratives. We have the Extinction Rebellion narrative, which believes that we should overthrow this current system and let these young, enthusiastic people run the show. But that's just as dangerous, might even be worse. Now, I want to tie this in to the Jesus narrative. Jesus used simple narratives. We call them parables, but the academics will call them narratives, to explore our existence. 
Now, Jesus was the worst systematic theologian of all time. If you want systems theology, you turn to Hebrews or Paul or someone else. Not to Jesus, because he's not mind to mind. He's heart to heart. And so you have the story of the prodigal son. And the people could feel the anguish of the father waiting for that son to come back. You can have the story of the Good Samaritan, and people will be ashamed as they realize that he is this foreigner, you know, not really one of the chosen people who was acting uh, the way God expected them. Or the pearl of great price, that you sell everything to get this thing. Everything. Your whole life is about getting it. And Jesus says this is about the kingdom of God. So Jesus told narratives to help to us to understand the real things of our existence. And underneath the Jesus narrative, we have God's story. The purpose of our existence. And if God's story starts with the people of the Jews, then we see it uh, enacted again in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And then it's going on. We're part of that narrative now. And now the kingdom becomes the focus of our story. The Christian narrative is open to challenge. People can challenge it because they understand it. We're not hiding something underneath, uh, believing in the market or whatever. It's not a narrative of power. It's a narrative of journeying together with others so that we all can make progress. And billions have, uh, have tried it over the generations and found it consistent. So just summing this bit up, underlying narratives. If you... If the underlying narrative is inconsistent with the world as it is, you're probably being, um, it's probably a lie. The science narrative is in the, but you can see, other narratives are more in the dark, but they are testable, always testable, at least the underlying bit. And if, they, if, the, if the underlying narrative is fine, you can begin to trust um, the, the narrative that you hear. And then we have the unknowable bit, which we struggle to understand. <clears throat> but the point I'm making is that closed narratives divide society. If you don't know what the assumptions and the worldview is, it's trouble. But open narratives can guide us. And the dominating narratives have to impose and they refuse to engage and that's why they become problems. I think Brexit was saddening and here I might uh, upset people, but I ask why did it happen? And I suspect the fault lies with the elite of, uh, of Europe who somehow or other weren't engaging with the ordinary people, particularly in Britain. Uh, they were just on a different plane. Closed narratives, I think, are the most dangerous thing we Christians face. Not science in particular. It's not just Dawkins or Marx. The danger we face is deceptive narratives that actually undermine our worldview. Um, years ago, the free world and the Christian, uh, the free world and the kingdom of God was seen to be the same thing. And you know, everyone thought the free world we are merely. Now we tend to think that socialism and, and the kingdom of God are the same thing. And I think there's problems with both those. <clears throat> the faith narrative embraces science and it can embrace other truth seeking narratives. And as science becomes more holistic, the light from the lamppost is being reflected over a wider range, displacing some societal narratives. And we see the science narrative spreading out and talking about the pandemic and global warming. It's starting to impact on society more and more. But science alone is not sufficient. It does, doesn't have underlying values. And so the faith narrative can underpin the science narrative because it provides a coherent set of values to inform science. And it can challenge other narratives as well. So we need open narratives to cross-fertilise our sense-making. We cannot survive as a human species unless these narratives, different ways of seeing the world, can communicate. Now, I just want to talk about the economics narrative and the problems it has. It's a narrative about well-being. And the basis is, if I grow tomatoes and you pull out my tooth, I give you some tomatoes and I'm better off because you pull out my tooth. We exchange labour and all is well. But it's based 
the theory of economics is based on a myth of equilibrium, that if everyone's doing this, uh, the whole society will, uh, everything will balance and everyone will be better off. And there's some funny things. Everyone seems to think that competition is key to a functioning market. But if you read Adam Smith, it's not competition, it's choice. It's because someone chooses to go to this baker and not that baker, according to Adam Smith, that the society starts to improve. Competition is just a means. It may have helped choice, but choice is what we're after. Now let's come back to the dominant economic myths, such as Alan Greenspan uh, believed. He believed that everything could be priced by the market. And the narrative, this neoclassical economic narrative, is weak. Technology, based on science, actually amplifies human labour. And that's actually the most critical thing in any economy. Solo, who was a Nobel Prize winner, did uh, an analysis of 40 years of growth in the US. And he was trying to find out what wasn't due to capital and labour, which is what you normally think an economy is. And he found there was a residual, and the residual was 88%. A very small, result, very large residual. And the thing that's missed out on the neoclassical economics is that knowledge goods don't behave like apples and oranges. If I uh, exchange a fish with you, I, I give you tomatoes and I have your fish, we eat them and it's gone. But if I teach you how to fish, it hasn't cost me very much, and we both know how to fish, then you teach someone else how to fish, they know how to fish, and then the whole world learns how to fish. Now that knowledge good of how to fish is not priced in the market, yet almost all the wealth we have is due to that. I'll just, I, I'm going to mention it, I'll mention it here. Um, a combine har harvester with one person driving it can, in six minutes, can harvest as much grain as 125 people working for a whole day, um, 150 years ago. <clears throat> That's the knowledge and the know-how of how to build a combine harvester. Now, again, the uh, neoclassical economics has an underpinning narrative that ignores sustainability because it thinks everything could be priced. And there was a conference in the 1990s and Solow and Stiglitz, both Nobel Prize winners, thought that resource problems will exist, but the market will be able to sort it out. Now, I've developed a holistic approach to an economy, seeing it as a system sustained far from equilibrium. And I see an economy like an ecology. Everything is interconnected. And it's sustained by the input of energy and the ejection of disorder as waste. So an economy is a, high, high, is a complex system, a low entropy, far from equilibrium complex system. The trouble is that the waste that we're getting rid of is called carbon dioxide, uh, amongst other things. And we're not getting rid of it properly. So this economy cannot last indefinitely. But coming back to the knowledge bit, originally people were sort of hunter-gatherers, then they invented the spear, the plough, farming, technology. All these are knowledge goods. And the reason why we are wealthier than the hunter-gatherer is that we have learned how to use these. And we're driving our economic system further from equilibrium, but harder to sustain. And here's a sort of picture um, where the blue represents energy coming in. Now, in the hunter-gatherer economy, the energy came from the sun. Now, most of it comes from fossil fuels. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the heat, uh, entropy and waste, carbon dioxide, all have to go out to maintain the system distant from equilibrium. And you can think of this as, say, a national economy. This might be a city or a sector like the farming sector. Within that, there'll be businesses, and within the businesses, they'll finally, we finally end up with the human family, which is the basis of our economy. <clears throat> so it's characterized by how far it is from equilibrium, how much energy needs to pump it to keep it going, and that's a problem. Uh, growth requires more energy. Now, our modern economy is consumer-based, energy-intensive. <clears throat> And as I mentioned, we have problems with the carbon dioxide that we can't get rid of. 
The hunter-gatherer didn't have this problem. If they fouled the nest, so to speak, they just moved on. And with my approach, you see that GDP isn't actually very helpful. Um, for example, if housing prices go up, rents go up, GDP goes up, but all that's happened is the poorer people have given money to the more wealthy, but the country isn't better off or the economy's not better off. Now I come back to the transcendent faith narrative as the key to crossing the dialogue between, or crossing different uh, narratives. It's, we are open to all truth-seeking narratives. The faith narrative, we've had to engage with others, otherwise we'd have been wiped out. And I think we need to be more forthright in the public square, because we know how to engage in a cross-narrative dialogue. And we recognise that as human, as human species, we must, we must learn to journey together. Remember, the incarnation is about God and Jesus coming to journey with us. And that is our, one of our basic narratives. Uh, the faith narrative is realistic about human nature and the natural world. Uh, we could challenge the unrealistic Pied Piper narratives who want quick solutions to everything, but in the end will lead us into a dark cave. We recognise that transformation is key. Now, not everyone may be transformed, but we as the body of Christ are able to be transformed. And we could shift our focus from a well-being focused on things and gadgets to a well-being based on values. So narratives must engage, otherwise the conversation is closed. And here are um, different narratives. We have the faith transcendent narrative on the left, the political, social, economic narrative up there, and the science and environmental narrative there. Now those blue rings are closed narratives, like the Dawkins narrative would be the one and the science one. People we might call fundamentalists who are not particularly good at uh, engaging with us would be there. And some of the modern movements like wokeism and so on might be up there. Now, being woke's all right, but the, if you lose the ability to engage with others, then it becomes a closed narrative. But interesting values are key to this. <clears throat> um, right. So we have to have uh, a cross-narrative dialogue, and we, we actually deal with the underlying narrative to see that we can... Um, make sense of those. We need common values and principles that cross the narratives so that we can make progress. Um, Mark Carney, who was governor of the Reserve Bank of Canada in the financial crash and then became governor of the UK Bank, he's now the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and so on. He's trying to shift the economics approach to one based on values not one based on price. And he quotes Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde says, the market knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. <clears throat> and so Carney's uh, trying to get an economic system where values start to become important rather than just some cost-benefit analysis or price or whatever you do. And he's written a book there and there's a BBC radio. The Reach Lectures in 2020, December, um, four hours of them, but excellent about why the financial crash, and he ends up with how can we deal with climate change. So the truth-seeking narratives. We are able, truth-seeking, we need a wider view of truth that actually understands the world as it is. The faith narrative could cross the different divides. divides. We've learned to engage, and we've got realistic perspectives on issues such as the pandemic, climate change, artificial intelligence, genetic technologies, and we should perhaps be asking the question in a time when we're emitting too, too much carbon dioxide, whether space tourism should be outside uh, humans. And, and I noticed Brentson was into space tourism last week or so. <coughs> the key is for the faith community to recognise that closed narratives will try and seduce us. And we must always try and engage with them at the level of the underlying narrative. Thank you. I'm just going to get some water if I may. I'm sure. Um, why don't you have a few questions?
was well, James can read it. Well, we have a few questions. Yeah. So James can read it. Um, then we have some questions afterwards as well. So anyone on the immediate response? Oh, no, no, the Chris, your dentist who can read it. I'm done with a few parts. Good idea. Yeah. An awful lot of tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I really like the concept of narratives. Um, you argued at the beginning that science is rational. Yeah. And I'm not sure it always is rational. Um, <coughs> but I'm, I'm pro science. Yeah, yeah. It's empirical. But what makes it rational? If someone oh. is developing bombs to kill people, what's. And uses oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry. Oh, but I think it's rational in terms of the way it does it. It doesn't speak from half it. But it uses rationality to do some really nasty things. Uh, but it's using reader, uh, reason, and it, and it sort of, what's the word? It suppressed narratives that it should be looking at. We shouldn't have um, science for science's sake. We should have science for the well being of others. Um, but that's not a common science narrative. Jonathan. And then, and then save the questions for just, us. Just a very quick comment, yeah. uh, Sean, your reference to Mark Cunn. Can I just affirm yeah. your view? Uh, yeah. that he has a lot to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. This book, Value, or Value to the Bracket S, is um, available at Unity Bookshops. It's a brilliant book. Yeah. And I encourage to read it. Yeah. Uh, he comes from a Catholic background. I'm not sure if he's a practicing Catholic, but he certainly has been informed very strongly by Catholic Yes. That's probably why he thinks the values, yes, yes. But you can see the read lectures if you can't afford the book. Yeah. Or listen to the read lectures. That's my thing, but they don't keep them on. Do you think there's a good transition from uh, the world with a, like an economy with an equilibrium base to a, 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 a sustainable economy? Um, or is it, does it take stages to. Well, well the way Carney does it is to put some values in, but. Um, an economy is not an equilibrium. Uh, the, the neoclassical economists are just playing wrong. It's not arguable. It's more like the human body. I'm not an equilibrium. I'm a homeostatic system sustained by food and getting rid of waste, carbon dioxide that I breathe out and so on. Um, an economy could be considered an equilibrium for the short term. You can approximately say I'm stable in the short term, but I'm not. If I don't get my food, so so uh, it's just the way it is. Okay, save all your other questions until the to the end. So we'll have we'll have um, Jeff now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well. I have something up there, but it's different from what's here, and I'm just trying to work out um, <laughs> what the issue is, and. It could be the splitter that that is there. So I'll just try to I'll shut this down and reopen. Okay, so far so good. I've got the same as there. Yep. Any moment now? <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you, Nicola, for the can't see Nicola for the invitation to uh, come and uh, speak here. It's about twenty years since I spoke in this church upstairs on the Star of Bethlehem, and I was going to say a little bit about that, but I've decided to um, truncate things a, a little bit. I'm very concerned about the people here. Can you? You can see the screen. You may not be able to see me all the time. Um, I'm sorry about that. Now look, I've got a, um, a slightly different perspective um, from uh, Sean here. And if taken sort of too literally, it's going to be sort of almost the polar opposite of um, Sean's. So l let me just bring the two together by saying that as we approach the Bible, I'm going to suggest that there are many more lights that are either on and we're not aware that they're on and shining, or we can flick them on. And um, 
science and physics provide uh, a marvelous opportunity to do exactly that. So I think by saying that, it sort of brings the two back together uh, somewhat. A little bit about um, binary ideas, first of all, physics and faith. Um, that's a binary, and a lot of people, my, um, a lot of my friends would say, uh, <clears throat> science and faith, that's an oxymoron. The two, it's, you know, they're, it's a, an antagonistic uh, binary, an incompatible uh, binary. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about that. And I want to start off with a couple of binaries that we find uh, in modern physics. So the first is the idea of, um, well, we know that we live in a universe, but the idea of a possible anti-universe uh, that exists um, to provide balance uh, to our universe. So this is the standard uh, model of um, particles um, of the universe and the ring around the outside. There are 12 particles there. You can see I should have a, a laser pointer here. Maybe I'll get if the battery is still so working. Is yeah. <clears throat> so these are, these are material particles around the outside. Here's um, the electron, which we're familiar with. This is the up and the down quarks that form protons and neutrons. This is a muon, a tau on. These are neutrinos. There are 12 matter particles there um, that are essential for our existence, essential for the existence of the universe. And each one of those particles around the outside um, possesses an antiparticle. These particles in here are the force particles that bind, um, <coughs> that basically mediate the forces between these matter particles. Um, okay, so if you have a real particle and an antiparticle, and you bring them together, they've got opposite sign, they will annihilate and produce two uh, photons, two gamma rays. You can reverse that process, bring two gamma rays in, <coughs> and they will annihilate and produce a particle and an antiparticle in exact quantities. Okay, so if you've got enough energy, you can produce a huge number of particles, but the number of antiparticles will exactly equal um, <clears throat> the number of antiparticles, I can't remember what, whether I said particles, but the number of particles and antiparticles must be identically equal. Now, <clears throat> here's a standard picture of the universe, um, starting in the first moments of the Big Bang there on the left, maybe I, I show here. <clears throat> first moments of the Big Bang, there's inflation that takes place, uh, and then the universe expands more slowly, but you see out here with the formation of uh, stars and galaxies, the universe is expanding a little bit. This cone is getting wider, um, <clears throat> and then it's accelerating um, closer to the present. And here's uh, this uh, spaceship is in the present. It's accelerating more rapidly um, due to this notion of dark <coughs> energy, which is causing an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Now, there's a big problem in uh, cosmology, <coughs> and that is that most of all those particles in the universe and the galaxies and stars and so on are particles not antiparticles. So where have all the antiparticles gone? There's about one antiparticle per billion real particles. Where have they gone? A proposal <clears throat> might be two years ago now that solved many problems in cosmology was that in the first moments of the Big Bang, both a real universe and an anti-universe came into existence at the same time. Okay, so there's the Big Bang, positive time heading this way, negative time heading this way. <clears throat> the anti-universe on the left-hand side is expanding backwards in time relative to us. <clears throat> but we might actually be in this one here on the left, and that would be the anti-universe on the right. And you couldn't tell the difference. <clears throat> They're going backwards in time, we're going forwards in time. Okay. The reason why I've raised this um, 
particular binary is that those two universes cannot talk to each other. Just the notion that this is backwards in time in the first instance mean that, means that we, forward in time, can't speak to them, we can't detect them. There might be signatures on the universe in those first moments of the Big Bang <clears throat> that suggest this universe might exist, but the two are completely non-overlapping. They don't um, talk to each other. Um, they're completely unaware of each other, except in a conceptual sense. Okay, so that's my first binary. Binary and completely unrelated and, and non-overlapping. <clears throat> You'll see where I'm heading with that because many people think that's the situation uh, between science and faith, physics and faith. Um, <clears throat> the second uh, binary that I want to um, mention, the battery has indeed gone on that, <clears throat> is that um, is this experiment that was conceived exactly 100 years ago uh, by Stern and Gerlach. <clears throat> Each one of those particles around the outside, the matter particles, have got an additional property which we call spin. And we talk about spin up and spin down. In a magnetic field, you only have spin up and spin down. You don't have spin sideways or spin at 10 degrees, 2 o'clock or whatever. Um, <clears throat> It has only two possible states. Um, and here's the experiment that was proposed. So spin is like a little magnetic moment. So each one of those particles is a little magnet and it's got a quantum of magnetic moments um, within it. <clears throat> the idea is that um, they had a furnace uh, with silver in it, heats it up until the silver evaporates. Silver's got an odd number of particles, protons and neutrons, in its nucleus. So if you have just two particles, they will go into a state in which one has got spin down, one has got spin up, and the total spin of the system is zero. But if you've got an odd number, there's one spin left over, a half spin it's called. One to spin left over, and it's going to be either up or down. In a magnetic field generated by the North Pole and the South Pole, and it's an inhomogeneous field, so the North Pole is tapered like this, and the South Pole has got a hole in it. Okay, so the field lines spread out like this. It's inhomogeneous. And when the spin passes through that medium, um, the upspins will be deflected upwards and the downspins will be deflected uh, downwards. And you see the beam splitting into two. And here's a typical um, <coughs> visualization of this. So that one was spin up, so it went up there. This one is spin down, so it goes down there. The next one is spin up again, it goes up there. And this is the standard depiction of what's going on, but it's false. If I can just, okay, we'll let it finish its course. Those ones there are spin up, those are spin down. But it's a false picture because it gives you the idea that um, when a particle comes through here, if it's got up spins going up, that's not the case. In quantum mechanics, until you carry out some kind of detection um, system, you don't know whether that particle has got spin up or spin down. And all you can describe is a wave function. And if you take the square or the magnitude of that wave function, that tells you how probable it is that you'll find a particle up there or a particle down there. But until that detection takes place at the screen, each one of those particles is in both locations. Okay? The beam is not split into two. The wave function has amplitude here, and it has amplitude here. And those two beams, if you like, are fully entangled. They're fully uh, connected and related um, to each other. So we have two different binary paradigms. This paradigm here is a paradigm where the binary system is essentially one, essentially a unity the other where they're uh, not overlapping at all. We use in physics um, 
terms such as orthogonal, if you've got two vectors and they're orthogonal at right angles, when you project, if they're not orthogonal, you can project this one down, drop the vertical, and the amplitude of this vector in this direction is this much. But if they're orthogonal and you project this down, it's zero. Okay, so there's zero overlap, they're non-overlapping, they're disjoint. Um, the other paradigm is where that, that of the two beams where they're entangled, entwined, co-mingled, complementary. <clears throat> and many people, um, uh, I can't think of his name now, up the Nova man, Stephen Cosmos, he wrote Cosmos. Okay. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> the chap who came up with the idea of Noma, non-overlapping magisteria. Oh, that's, um, he wrote Cosmos. Uh, yeah. I didn't know Gould, that. Uh, what's it? Gould. Gould. Stephen Gould. Gould. Thank you. Got there. Um, <clears throat> he, he came up with this idea. So, from his perspective, as a scientist, he was prepared to accept religion uh, because in his view, they were completely non-overlapping. They were two different domains of, of knowing or understanding of dealing with the world. And he was perfectly comfortable with that as an atheist. Um, and he had meetings with the Pope and presented talks about non-overlapping magisteria, magisteria uh, being particularly a Catholic um, notion. I want to suggest that there is another realm here um, in relation to the question of, um, of science and faith, physics and faith, that th there must be a necessarily overlapping magisteria, because in my view, the essence of Christianity is associated with historical claims. And as soon as one is dealing with historical claims, then one can bring to bear um, the various tests of um, <clears throat> of science, if you like, of archaeology and astronomy, um, history, uh, geography, and so on. And I want to suggest that in relation to physics and faith, that we're dealing with a binary that is necessarily uh, overlapping. Okay, so I would now like to present a few examples. Of, it's quite warm in here, so let me... <laughs> cool off a little. So I, I could talk all day and all the next day um, of examples of how one can bring to bear um, the techniques of physics to address uh, questions. Um, so just think of these as some of the lampposts where the lights could be turned on um, in relation to the scriptures. Okay, so I want to talk uh, tonight just about one of these. Originally I was planning to also talk about the birth of Jesus and the, and the star of Bethlehem, but um, in the interest of time, let me just talk about Daniel's prophecy about the coming Messiah. And this is something which uh, occupied the mind of Isaac Newton a great deal. And he's written a book uh, about this. And he had to go to all sorts of gymnastics to resolve the question in his mind, <clears throat> and I want to suggest that that is not necessary because additional information has come to us um, more recently. Daniel 9, uh, 25, 26, you'll, many of you will be uh, aware of this. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the coming of Messiah the Prince shall be seven sabbaticals and 62 sabbaticals. Put those together, 69 sabbaticals, the sabbatical being uh, seven years. And after this shall Messiah be put to death, but not for himself. It's an amazing statement, really. Um, <clears throat> now, the first half of Daniel 9 provides us with the first key to unlock this. And I'll tell you about that right now. So it's 69. Lots of sabbaticals, 69 times 7, and the first part of Daniel 9 tells you, when you really delve into it, 
that the years are years of 360 days. So it's 1, 000, sorry, 173,880 days. The command to rebuild Jerusalem uh, can be found in Nehemiah chapter 2, rebuild the city, the wall, and the palace. And uh, the date that this starts uh, from is the first of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, the first. Now here's a relief of uh, King Artaxerxes, and you probably wouldn't recognize his face there. Um, but the big question is, when was the 20th year of Artaxerxes? And Newton <coughs> decided quite on quite simple grounds that it was the year of um, 445 BC. 465 BC, Artaxerxes assumed the throne after his father was assassinated by the, um, um, the, the head of the royal protection army. <laughs> Not very good royal protection. Um, but there we go, Artabanus. So, count forward 20 years, you would think it's 465. But actually, um, there's a beautiful uh, clay tablet, cuneiform ta clay tablet that was found in the ruins of Babylon um, 300 years after uh, Isaac Newton wrote about this question. And it's a summary of lunar eclipses from 567 BC to 99 BC, nearly 500 years. And here it is. Um, and there's a sort of a, a drawing of, of what is there. The, the f first line is the regnal year of the king. That's the next uh, line. And this uh, column here, in every case, is 18. If you look down here, you can count there are eight little daggers pointing down and one dagger angled at the side, angled this way. And that's a 10 plus 8, 18. And 18 years was an important period for the Babylonians uh, because that was 18 full leap years. And it's the length of time that it takes um, for if you have an eclipse now, if you go 18 years, 10 days, and a third of a day, you'll come back to the same eclipse because the sun and the moon um, in the same positions relative to each other. Okay, so... If we take a look at this, um, here's the translation. So there's one in the time of Nebuchadnezzar the, the second. That's the one who, um, under whom uh, Jerusalem was uh, destroyed in 586 uh, BC. And here are the ones that are important. Artaxerxes the first. Um, so there's a lunar eclipse in the sixth year of Artaxerxes the first, and there's one in the 24th year. And I've hunted uh, through, I've got an astronomy program, hunted very carefully through, and these are easily identified. This one is 11 p.m. on the 17th of July, 458 BC. This one is 7 a.m., 28th of July, 440 uh, BC. And here it is. Okay, we, we don't need to go through the full thing. But you can identify to the minute um, when that eclipse took place. Now here's the interesting thing. Look at the time difference between those two. It is exactly 18 years, 10 days, and one third of a day. If you want to check the one third, 11 p one third of a day is eight hours. 11 p.m. plus eight hours is 7 a.m. Okay, so this is the 24th year, that second one, the 24th year of Artaxerxes and it was 440 BC. So the beginning of the year, um, September of the previous year would have been 441 BC, and the 24th year goes from September 441 to September 440. Okay, so the 20th year of Artaxerxes, therefore, is September 445 to September 444. And the month of Nisan, March, would have been 444 BC. And now everything resolves, and there's no gymnastics uh, required um, as introduced by uh, Newton. When was the first of Nisan, 444 BC? I've simulated the view of the crescent new moon from uh, Babylon, and 
There it is on the 3rd of March, 444 BC. I think you can just see that faint uh, rim there. But I've suppressed the sunlight. And in sunlight, you would not be able to see that. And I would suggest that in sunlight, um, sun rising, uh, moon setting, no, sun setting, moon rising, are both in the same quadrant uh, of the sky, um, that, that crescent uh, new moon would be observable on the right-hand side. So 4th of March, 444 BC, plus our 1,000, sorry, 173,880 days, divide by 365.242 to convert to Julian uh, years, it's 476 years and 26 days. If you do the calculation, 4th of March, 444 BC, and add those numbers and take into account the, all of the, um, the leap years that uh, take place in that period, you come to the 30th of March, 33 AD, and that is in the Jewish calendar, the 10th of Nisan, 33 AD, and that's the very day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. It's very interesting what he said. You, you'll recall that um, <clears throat> as he came into Jerusalem, he looked out over the city and he wept for it. And he said, how often I long to gather you um, as, a chick, as, a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Let's now compare with what was said in Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the coming of Messiah the Prince shall be seven sabbaticals, 62 sabbaticals, and after this shall Messiah be put to death, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus said as he came up to the top of the Mount of Olives and that glorious view across the Kidron Valley of the city of Jerusalem and the stunning view of the temple, um, golden clad and silver clad and pure white marble um, with the rising sun behind, um, <clears throat> described so wonderfully by uh, Joseph, Josephus at the time. Jesus, here, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, now your enemies will build an embankment against you. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What a profound statement. First of all, the emphasis of this day. And I'm sure that Jesus was aware that this day was fulfilling that marvelous prophecy of Daniel um, 500 years earlier. Astonishing. <clears throat> But also the second claim, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What a profound claim that he was in the flesh, uh, God coming to the people of Jerusalem, of Judah, of all Palestine, of all the world, us included. Four days later, on the 14th of Nisan, Jesus died on the cross at 3 p.m. And in 70 AD, the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary were destroyed by Titus in complete um, fulfillment of what the vision that was given to Daniel uh, all those centuries earlier. There's a profound statement in the Bible. is full of many such um, profound mysteries that the light can be turned on using science to, um, to assist in understanding uh, what is being stated and in validating uh, the text. I find that is astonishing, not just then, uh, but to this very day. In a sense, it's a miracle in black and white. And if we ever doubted uh, the existence of um, miracles, there is a, a miracle in black and white. And I'm in awe and in worship um, in relation to not just this, but the many uh, examples that we see within the scriptures. So I'm going to stop there uh, just by suggesting that physics and faith are not these separated entities, but they come together and they belong together <clears throat> because they're different ways of describing uh, God's world. 
and in many way, cases they're not different ways, but they intersect fully and completely. Um, they're very much entangled. And we are gifted in the modern era, in the modern era <clears throat> in which we look for evidence, we long for evidence, and <clears throat> we want everything to be evidence-based. This is the very era in which people are leaving the church for some false narrative that they have that there is... Um, a contradiction uh, between this hand and this hand. And we need to take that message to our people, to the, to the world, um, that science and faith belong together. Because the one central truth of this universe is that it is created by God Almighty. And therefore there can be nothing more important than each one of us engaging with that reality and determining our life's course in relation to that reality. So, as you can see, I could go on and on about so many wonderful things. Now, Sean talked about <clears throat> how science is from the head and what is important is heart to heart. I can't distinguish those two things. I am passionate about my science. I am passionate about Sorry, I did mean to wave this up at one stage. I'm passionate about this book and I'm passionate about the narrative of uh, the Christian uh, gospel because at heart, we're not talking about truth and moral truth. We're talking about what is true, what can be shown to be veracity, what can be verified. I'll finish with this um, one uh, statement that Peter made, if I can um, recall it, we did not present to you cleverly devised myths when we told you of the coming of our Lord Jesus. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we're not eyewitnesses in the literal sense, but we can look back through the lens of science to this world that is presented within the Bible. And we can become, in our minds, we can become eyewitnesses. And we need to be taking that eyewitness account to the world about us. Thank you. Questions for both of you then. We can see that. I know that's hard to say questions. <clears throat> I'm sorry about this cold that I have, but you know, at least I'm distanced from you. Yes. When was Jesus born? I'm sorry, when was when was Jesus born? Which year? Solomon said to be four BC, but how does that fit if he was Crucified in 33. Yep. Um, so, you know, if I presented that other presentation, um, there are many things that... So if you just read the biblical record literally, it's about 3 to 2 BC. It's within that period. But there are other early writers, Tertullian and others. Tertullian gives a very definite way of identifying um, when Jesus' birth was. And since you ask, I'll, I'll, quote, <laughs> I'll quote exactly um, what he says, the birth of Jesus. Um, he says, Augustus began to rule 41 years before the birth of Jesus and died 15 years after his birth. Now, if you take that literally, it actually it narrows it down very tightly. It implies his birth was between the 19th of August, 3 BC, and the end of October, 3 BC. And if you look at the birth of John the, John the Baptist, um, through the, the, the courses of the, those who served in the temple, you can work out when John the Baptist was born. And that narrows it down to the second week of September. And then we can start from that and build up a, a picture. But So I believe it's in um, 3 BC. And then you can follow the story of the Star of Bethlehem and, and um, <coughs> see what was happening in the sky. And it's very interesting. It was a, a, 
a, a unique of event um, within a time span of about a thousand years, 500 years either side. Why do thinking? Can I just ask you guys whether you actually do disagree with each other? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jeff said, seemed to sort of say, suggest at the beginning that he did. So can you talk to each other? Well, I don't think we disagree. I'm just saying, uh, certainly, if you can bring uh, the mind and the heart, and you, you've got a much fuller understanding of what's going on than if it's just the rational, you know, intellectual yeah. process. That, so, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I, what I was thinking, I suppose, is, you know, I, I want to avoid this kind of notion that can easily come out of a presentation like this, uh, you know, that you can sort of magically uncover every mystery in the in the Bible, you know, through the application of archaeology or astronomy or whatever, and it's not possible. Um, but there are many cases where you can turn on uh, Sean's light, and it's that that gives us confidence to accept some of the other things that we need to, um, for, for which we don't have evidence. And of course then we have to use our rational thinking. So for example, one of the one of the examples there is Joshua's command to for the sun to stop. Well if you look at the Hebrew word, it's it's more like not stop but be covered. And it's classic language for um, eclipses at, at the time. You know, if the sun stopped in, in the sky then it means that planet Earth would All have to stop off. rotating, and and we would still have volcanism, drastic volcanism going on now, from that event, you know, four thousand years ago. Um, so we have to apply our rational mind um, to to things, um, and not just blindly accept what is there, because what is there may not. What, what seems to be there may not be what is there and what was intended when it was written. So we need to bring to bear all the tools that we have available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, question over here? Yeah. Neil. So, um, I, I've been thinking about values-based way of dealing with things. So the church claims to be a values-based organization, but it often falls into the mistake of becoming a terribly rules based. Yes, yes, of course. Um, and I think Jesus came to free us from all those rules and to make a much harder road to hoe, which is we do things based on values. Whereas the problem on the other end, on the other side is that you have something that's a values free yes, organization. Yeah. That science actually can be values free. So you've probably seen, Jeff, that some of our colleagues in science act in ways that uh, Makes you believe that they have no values of their own. Um, so, how I'm trying to unpack this is that one of the things we're battling with at the university is we've got, as a university, a set of values which we hold up as being these are the values the university espouses so fairness, integrity, responsibility, respect, empathy. And this is a great thing to have on a piece of paper. How do you put this in, how do you take something like that as a church or an organization or a society and put this into practice? Because how do you get all the individuals to buy into that? And how do you get the individuals to actually embody that? So we'll give you a binary response. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it is um, it's incumbent on um, mature scientists and particularly Christian uh, scientists who are Christian um, to engage with with young scientists to impart th the moral aspect of scientific endeavor um, you know I don't think it's ever taught anywhere but it's so essential that in integrity um, and it's so easily subverted. I think it needs to be explicitly addressed and mentored um, with young researchers. So that's my first response. Well, one of the problems with 
young scientists and PhD students is actually it's very hard what they're doing. That's their whole life and they don't have time to reflect on it. And I only had time to reflect on it when I got out of the science and went into more management things. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so there's that, that whole problem. The scientists are led to believe, uh, you know, that what they're doing is, well, it's, it's completely rational and so on. They just don't have the tools to critique it in any way. And I think Jeff's right, the leading scientists need to come back. But it's hard work, isn't it? Those who have been through that. <coughs> I'm down the back, there was a question. Oh, that's it. What does clinical mm -hmm. Yes, and Jeff, you gave uh, September as the month of Jesus' birth. Yep. And that's based on the math coming from Daniel. Uh, no, not for his birth. No, that just comes from a direct reading of, of, of the gospel records combined with a lot of the... I mean, there were probably 14 of the early church fathers who gave a ballpark figure for when Jesus was born. Every one of them is consistent. Every one of them brackets this, you know, the, the date that I finally settle on. Um, and that date that I finally settle on is basically described in um, Revelation chapter 12. 12, 1 to 3, where it talks about the birth of the male child who will um, rule the nations. Okay, just that the December birth is more in keeping with animal husbandry. <laughs> <laughs> if um, Jesus was born with shepherds on the field. Yes, yeah. Um, so my understanding is the shepherds come in uh, sometime in October. They're no longer out in the fields. They're certainly not out um, in December. We say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, just a question for you, Jeff. Um, just the vector, the vector. Uh, this uh, the part where you calculated the. Uh, we are right to calculate uh, Jesus' birth or uh, his crucifixion, the day before his crucifixion. You also yep. Um, <clears throat> how did you? I couldn't quite understand because you used the Babylonian uh, astronomical tab um, tablets. From what I understand, it's um, uh, they're, they're, the the Babylonians use the hexagonal system of calculation, so based on six, <coughs> God to ten, like we, the decimal system we have. So, um, the, how did you get the ten? You know, like the ten, fourteen, because I know that eighteen is is, is a bit, uh, six based on six. You know, but, 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 but I was wasn't sure about the so the, the, the calculation. The times of the day are divided, it's a six-fold yeah. um, rotation. Um, <clears throat> so there are six lots of six and then six lots of those six by six and, and so on to make up the 24 hours. That doesn't actually uh, come into it. There are other Babylonian records that describe eclipses uh, that take place and you have to work through um, that timing system in the day to get the the hour of the day uh, as to when that occurred. Very interesting thing is so many of these records um, have a statement, uh, they describe the eclipse in detail and then at the end um, the writer says, I did not observe it because it was below the horizon or because it was cloudy. You know, so that to me is a very profound thing. Even way back then, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, a calculation says that an eclipse took place, precisely where and when it took place, but it wasn't seen, but it surely took place as a material physical event, even though it was only an abstract calculation that the Babylonian astronomer was doing. And I think that's wonderful, really. It's a profound statement about the human mind, isn't it? Um, I know, I mean, I've visited the museum in Iraq, these were shown at that time, you know, the, the, they were shown in the, in the museum. <clears throat> yeah, well, I just wanted to use that to establish when was the 20th year of Arctic Xerxes. Back, back row? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I was interested in the, um, what you're saying about the science being about the mind, mm. like sort of being about the heart. And I was just sort of wondering what you thought about the stomach. <laughs> Sorry, thought about the stomach. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, uh, Hebrews used, uh, Jesus talked about the gut, didn't he? Uh, but we, we, bowels of mercy. Yes, we, we, we softened it a bit. Uh, well, maybe, maybe, yes, gut to gut, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we still talk about it having a gut feeling, don't we? Yes. But there is there is that nerve which is di directly runs the from the nerve. stomach to the to the brain, which is um, considered to be, you is know, any, very active. Is there any actual record of when the census was supposed to be? Did they talk about that the that Mary and Joseph had to travel for? Was there any talk any record mm. of actually when that census occurred to tie in with? The, Confirms the dates that you're talking about? There was a registration um, to acknowledge the um, which year of Augustus was it? I can't remember now whether it was the 25th year. Um, but there was a registration um, that was recorded right across the entire empire um, when Augustus was um, uh, declared to be father of the empire. And it was on that, um, let's call it Jubilee, I can't remember exactly uh, whether it was 25 years, uh, but that registration took place throughout the empire. Um, and and that, the, the timing of that fits perfectly, September. And, and, for the of, time, and the time of the year, because um, we celebrated the birth of Jesus at Christmas, in Jerusalem, that would not have been an appropriate time of the year because it would be midwinter. <laughs> so, was it, yeah. well, September would have been autumn after so I take, the harvest. So we're talking about something that I haven't presented on, but um, I, I, um, I take this little jump, but it's not essential. So I, I, I pin it down to the 11th of September, as many others do, in 3 BC. Um, and I asked, why is it that in the early church that uh, the 25th of December was so important? And it has nothing to do with Saturnalia, um, as many people uh, say. You know, it's the wrong date. Um, but if you go back from the 11th of September and count uh, the, the number of uh, days for gestation, it's it looks like it was the day of conception. And that's when the incarnation took place, not on the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus, um, theologically, is not significant. The incarnation is theologically significant at the moment of conception, which is entirely consistent with being the 25th of December. Um. Could you say TV1, TV3 were a narrative? My question, which is the truest preview channel on TV? And that might mean reliable. And there was so much culture and selling on TV and media, like cars and banks and health, either speaker or both speakers. What, which, what, is the, which, which channel would we rely on? Do we say? What's the question? Um, which is the truest preview channel on TV or Reliable? Do you watch? Do you watch? No, I wouldn't. I, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you which was the truest church. I mean, it's it, it's a it's a relevant issue, isn't it? Um, and in in the way in which we approach uh, faith, there's definitely a, a, a cultural aspect. There are aspects of my church that appeal to me hugely, and to many others who come in um, from outside. But for many, it, it, it wouldn't appeal, and that's fine. You know, we can have um, YA churches and ZB churches and YC churches. Um, that's sort of a more cultural um, side of things. Um, 
And I think it's good that we have uh, alternatives here. We, we don't have a uniform theology and we don't have uh, a uniform moralistic uh, stance on, on things. It's all um, entertainment. It's all, it's all, a lot of stuff is, uh, have you seen preview? Have you seen uh, First Light? No, I, 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 I watch that stuff very little. I think you have to make a television watch We're the wrong yes. people. Done it. So, Sean, sure, you, you talked about teaching the other side just science as moral code. Mm -hmm. What what do you benchmark that against within science? Oh, As Christians, well, we would draw ours from our faith. Well, science has values itself. Like it could be science for science's sake. Um, now. Is, we need to bring other ideas into that. Is that a valid uh, use of science? Or should science be for all of us to some extent? And that shifts uh, what you might be doing. I mean, scientists believe that science in itself, the truth in itself from science, is good in its own right, irrespective of how it might be used or whatever. Um, that can be a bit dangerous. So I'm just saying we just need to try and um, let values come into science as well. But science doesn't necessarily have to have them. What it is that people, Christians, need to come in and, you know, say, let it, like, for example, should we be having space tourism when we've got a problem of carbon dioxide emissions? That's a human value system, not really a science one. So that's what I'd do. A, 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 a postmodern young scientist could say, well, that's fine for you, but I don't agree, so oh. you would like. Well, so there's no within science. Science no, is not postmodern. No, no. It's very neutral in a sense. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. Can, can I say though that um, th there is a relevant issue here? So at the moment, we have a lot of people who say follow the science in relation to COVID 19. But what really does that mean? Um, you know, so the, there's the health science, there's the genetic science. Is the economic science which Sean talked about, you know, and overall there's got to be a, a, a moral um, aspect to the way in which we respond. Um, what we're doing is not just following the science, um, it's, it's much wider than that. We have to take into account um, wider impacts, we have to take into account a, a moral stance, and it's not following the science, it's following human values. Okay. Sure. You, you've obviously um, done a lot of work on narrative. Yes. Yeah. For us, coming to listen to you, how, how, what advice would you give us as to how we can question our own internal narrative? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's only by talking to people outside your own <coughs> discipline, um, to some extent. I think it's quite difficult to understand our own narratives. You need someone else to come and say, oh, is that what you believe? <laughs> 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 Well, any better solution? Yeah, go. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, the fundamental underpinning of um, empirical science is, is the notion of um, provisionality. Um, this is provisional, pending, further investigation. I think that's probably overstated. You know, if you're taking a purist view of things, that that is the case, and and that that thinking. Um, emerged on the back of various scientific revolutions that took place. Are we seeing any major scientific revolutions now? It's not clear. You know, the, the physics of semiconductors to describe uh, computers is pretty well fixed and there's not going to be some sort of revolution that comes along. The, the, the science behind um, electronics is no longer provisional. You, you know, it's a trillion dollar business. Um, so we have to bear that in mind, um, that while provisionality is an important aspect of science and provisionality involves the whole issue of, of introspection and examining and re-examining and other people coming in and critiquing, um, at the same time science really proceeds under um, a process of weight of evidence, you know, um, beyond reasonable doubt we accept that this is so, and we don't go on saying it's, it's only provisional, you know, something else is going to come up. But, and that can become um, 
postmodern can become postmodernism, you know, if it's not anchored. This will anchor, and I think it's, it's the interplay of the two that's important. Yeah. A question for both of you. Is God or can God ever be a testable scientific hypothesis? God can be a, a hypothesis, so that's the first step. Um, you want to pick up well, on that? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> if we all got wiped out or whatever, perhaps it's testable. Um, I think that we have to live that we need a certain level of faith, but it, the question is how valid is our underlying narrative? How secure is that? Um, and, and, and the Christian narrative is, is reasonably secure uh, and consistent. People don't agree with it or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that's probably the best we can do. <clears throat> Some people, Sean, would say, um, you know, the scandals now attaching to Christianity are mm. some sort of invalidation of the narrative, wouldn't they? What would you say to them? Ah, okay, you can negate it by the behaviour of people who call themselves Christian. Mm. Um, I, I, th I think that's terribly embarrassing, um, and I can't personally solve that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, but the trouble is we have so-called heroes in these things. Christianity is billions of people over the last uh, two millennia, basically, and it's they who change the world, um, and it's they who try and live out their lives as best they can. I think we have a clearer vision in our generation than we did a couple of hundred years ago when the power structures of society was different. Um, but the mere fact that these things are coming up and people are criticising them um, means that we're, we're more open and we're more secure uh, because we can do that. Okay, you. Yes, uh, just to go back to your question, which is a very important question. So, first of all, <clears throat> there can be a God hypothesis. And I think, it, um, to some extent, it can be tested and, in principle, it's potentially falsifiable. Certainly, I think the Christian gospel is potentially falsifiable, and that's why I think it sits hand in hand with science, because that's the test of, of science. Um, you can start building up a picture, you know, and you might build up this weight of evidence. I mean, the universe is unbelievably, astonishingly, finally balanced, you know, you'll be aware of the many, many um, knife-edge uh, balance factors that um, without every single one of these being in perfect balance, we wouldn't be here, you know. So um, you can't just whip up a, a universe just like that, uh, you know, any time you want to. This, this is a very serious uh, affair, and it looks incredibly as though it were designed to be this way. You know, so extremely, extremely fine balance means hugely improbable. Mm. So you can build up a, a case on those grounds. You also build up a case on scriptural grounds, you know. But ultimately, the, the, um, the greatest argument is the person of Jesus, um, which is absolutely astonishing, you know. Jesus astonished so many people. He astonished uh, Albert Einstein. Um, he was in complete awe of the person of Jesus. Um, he you know, and that's the ult ultimate argument, I think, for a Christian. I think so too. He's also the Logos, and one of the things that impresses me is the information content mm. of the universe. Mm. Okay, over here, over here. Thank you. Uh, regarding your last one about the balance of the universe, Dr. David Wilkinson from Durham University, who's also the head of Cranham Hall, he's an astrophysicist. And certainly for him, the beauty of the balance, the fine balance of the universe, was the thing that helped him believe that there was a God. He said it's, it's just so unlikely that this balance to, so that absolutely substantiates your point. Uh, regarding the existence of God, I was reminded of uh, Tom Stoppard's play, Smith, we can go look to the arts, his play, Jumpers begins with a moral philosopher who's arguing about the existence of God or not. And he determines that the only way to answer one way or the other is if you, have, if you pre allow for the existence of a God. He says, unless you pre allow for the existence of a God, you cannot argue for it. 
an early by pre aligned brick can you argue for it? I, I don't think there's any sort of a great scientific value behind that, but certainly for a, a, a philosophy point of view, I, I'm much more interested in that. Yeah, yeah. so that's the, the high, you've got to start with the hypothesis yeah. first, yeah, mm -hmm. and then test it. Dave. Okay, just a question about um, when I was working in universities in the 80s and 90s in the UK, um, the Christian unions were full of scientists. But now, it seems it's the other way around. What's, what's, your, what's your take on that? When you say the other way <coughs> round? Well, I was having a conversation with somebody today about the yep. chaplaincy up here yep. uh, that is predominantly humanity. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, uh, I just find that's a fascinating turnaround. Why is it that actually uh, uh, those who are scientists are not moving towards the faith like they used to? I'll talk about that because I was chaplain for a while there. Um, I think the difficulty is that chaplains tend to be non-scientists and they, well, they're slightly jealous People who are trained in the humanities are slightly jealous of science and the certainty of science. And, um, and, and, and they think the real thinking is done by the philosophers and the theologians. And science is incredibly busy. Um, arts and humanities, they write essays and they do all these things, but they have time to think. Scientists don't. Um, PhD students are, you know, flat tap doing an experiment at midnight um, or, and I think that they have to be you have to reach out to the science community more than I think whereas the other communities find it much easier to, to, to belong and that's my feeling over with it we did have Dennis was involved wasn't mm -hmm. it what we call it that there were about David Newton's time there was um, noose was it Christian noose was it called uh, you're involved in that, I think, or what came along. It was sort of a wider view of Christianity, a Christian noose now, uh, the Greek word, um, and, and and the science had, had had a play in that. But I think you have to you have to target it more than it is. Um, Within my institute, there there's a large number of um, Christians, and that's physicists and engineers. Um, I go often to Cambridge, and of course there's the Faraday Institute there, um, and, and that's tremendously active and lots of wonderful people. Um, but I'm certainly aware in places like the Cavendish Laboratory of, of still quite a large number of scientists who are Christian. I think things are a bit different in England, actually, because... Um, Maybe. There are, there's a lot of theology, for example, taught in universities, and hmm. theology and science, there are several chairs of science and theology. In the annual meeting of the Fellows of the Royal Society, they have a, um, a church service, and a, quite a large proportion of the Fellows go to that. That doesn't mean necessarily anything about their beliefs, uh, but there's still a very strong commitment there. Uh, John. Um, Jeff. Uh, the kind of work you're doing, um, the other journals that uh, that are publishing this kind of work, where can people sort of follow up to look at this kind of thing and also to... People write books, I think, rather yeah, than I mean, journal articles. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is there any one or two of those books that you can recommend? Sean has been badgering me for years. Yes. Right. The um, stuff that you've I'm, done here. I'm, I'm about two thirds the way through. Um, just about Jesus, okay. um, and you know, I never cease to be surprised uh, uh, about the amount of data that that can be addressed. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. The biblical archaeology must have some stuff like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but um, the sense that it's been very successful, it's been stunningly successful in describing a lot, but also there's a great sense that there's a lot more that's yet to be known that just to be thought out beyond the standard of the world. Yep. There's still a massive revolution that comes. 
which may completely overturn a lot of our <coughs> ways of thinking about it, even though we're consistent with what we know. But in a sense, what, what, do you have a comment about that? that there's, there's just so much we don't know. Even, even in the universe, there's so much we don't know. So yep. Really, yep. Right. Um, I think um, that some of the things that have been signaled uh, for physics beyond the standard model probably won't come to anything. You know, so I showed the universe expanding like this and then curving upwards um, due to the accelerated expansion. You, you know, David Wiltshire at Canterbury University has his t um, timescape um, cosmology, which recognizes that. And, and the whole community now recognise that some parts of space are more densely occupied by matter and others are less densely. So clocks tick um, more slowly in these regions and faster in these regions. And if you take that into account, the type 1a supernova um, events that have been used to prove the accelerated expansion, uh, they're, they're explained you know, without introducing dark energy. Occam's razor, you know, if, if you don't need it, don't in introduce it. Um, but at the same time, we know that there are fundamental problems, you know, re resolving um, quantum mechanics with gravity. Um, there's an impasse there at the moment, and that needs to be resolved. And that will be, that will bring a revolution of some sort. Um, but it, I don't think it'll change the approximations that we have here in, in relativity and the approximations that we have in quantum mechanics, not approximations, but the techniques. Um, the question is, can we ever in encounter the energy density that's required to investigate the intersection of these? And um, the big machines that are being used now are orders of magnitude um, too low in energy. So it's it's going to be tricky, you know, we're going to have to very soon use up all of the energy that's available in a year on planet Earth in order to do these experiments, and morally we can't do that. Yeah, yeah. so the standard model is like 22 unknown constants, or well, yep. like empirical constants, so in a sense the you know, theoretical results of why they have the thing to do, and you're right, to go down. Super high energies to perhaps discover this. Yep. So we're facing this fact that we may never know what's really Yeah, and the, the, there doesn't necessarily need to be a reason for um, identifying the pr precise value of those constants. These may just be the, the boundary conditions that you've got to put in to understand it, and they remain a mystery, as you say. Yeah, even the same with that mystery, I think we should bring the formal discussion to an end. <coughs> but please yep. do keep um, conversation on for a little while if you um, if you want to, if you are both happy to stay for a few minutes. Mm. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and thank you, Sarah, for opening up the space to to all of us and please do come next week, um, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock to the Cathedral um, of St Paul in Molesworth Street um, for Science and Spirituality where um, Andrew Saunders, Andrew Shepherd and I will be giving short talks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>